House Frey. Once famous for sucking money out of travellers wishing to cross the Green Fork River, now infamous for grabbing the revered custom of guest right, getting it drunk, and shoving a dagger deep into its belly. The respectable Freys of old used cunning to build up their wealth, and demonstrated bravery in rebelling against the ironborn tyrant, Harren the Black. So how did they transform into a house of rats and weasels? Luckily, I found someone to talk about this reviled family with me. The great lawmaster himself, Quinn the GM. Hello, glad to be here, and thank you very much for the introduction and for having me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Quinn the GM, I'm another guy who makes videos about A Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon here on YouTube. I'm thrilled to be a guest here, though given the current circumstances and topic of conversation today, perhaps I should be a bit more wary than I currently am. The Quinn in the North arises. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyway, let's start with the origins of House Frey. Despite their wealth and size, the Freys smell like new money. In fact, they're one of the youngest noble houses in all of Westeros. 600 years ago, the first ever Lord Frey was awarded lands and nobility, and began construction on the bridge crossing the Green Fork, one of the three main rivers of the Trident. Many years passed before his grandson oversaw the bridge's completion, as well as the creation of a wooden keep on each side. The keeps were eventually replaced with hard stone, and earned the moniker of the Twins. The sigil of House Frey, of course, boasts the Twin Towers of the Crossing, blue on a silvery grey field. Or more officially, <clears throat> Sondre, a bridge azure, at either end a tower of the same. <clears throat> Goes hard. Their house words have yet to be revealed, although in Season 6 of Game of Thrones, the Frey shout, We stand together. Whether this is show canon only, or the writers got this from George, we don't yet know. We do know that the Freys gained their wealth and power by demanding tolls for safe passage across the Green Fork. The old money of Westeros, those ancient houses with deeper noble roots, consider the Freys to be little more than upjumped toll collectors. At some point in time, the Freys tried and failed to conquer Greywater Watch, the seat of House Reed in the neck. As Jojen Reed tells Bran Stark, Andals and Iron Men, Freys and other fools, all those proud warriors who set out to conquer Greywater. Not one of them could find it. Animosity towards the Cranach men has certainly not ceased if little Walder Frey is anything to go by. In A Clash of Kings, he calls them mud men and frog eaters. Ah, so the Cranach men are the French people of Westeros, interesting. After King Harwin Hor of the Iron Isles conquered the Riverlands, the Freys were subjugated under three generations of ironborn tyrants. But everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. And by Fire Nation, of course, I mean three incestuous dragon riders. Following the conquest of Heron the Black, the Freys soon exchanged one king for another. 300 years prior to the beginning of the main series marked a massive paradigm shift for Westeros as a whole. No longer were the Riverlands their own independent nation, but rather a part of a singular country with six of the other seven kingdoms. This was all thanks to one remarkable individual, Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon began conquering Westeros, one region at a time, and the Riverlords saw this as their chance to rise up against the tyrannical Heron Whore. Edmund Tully led the forces of this new combined army and soon marched against Hall itself. The fame castle burned, and Edmund Tully was named Lord of the Riverlands, now serving King Aegon I Targaryen. House Frey swore fealty to this new river lord, despite having a larger army than their lieges. It soon seemed as though the Freys had exchanged one tyrant for another. Maegor I Targaryen, called the Cruel, seized power following the death of his brother Aenys, usurping the throne from Prince Aegon Targaryen. The Tullys supported Maegor's claim to the throne, as maintaining the status quo was very much in their interest. They'd gained a sizable amount of power from the Targaryen conquest, and Maegor offered at least the potential of more, or at the very least continuity. The Freys broke with their liege lords in this conflict, and instead supported Prince Aegon Targaryen, who at this point was called the Uncrowned. The main clash of this conflict, the battle beneath the god's eye, took place in the Riverlands, not far from Frey Holdings. At this battle, Maegor slew his nephew on Dragonback, snuffing out the rival claimant and ending this brief conflict where it stood. Aegon's supporters soon broke rank and returned to their castles. The Freys are not mentioned during this battle, nor in its aftermath, so they most likely escaped relatively unharmed. Once Maegor's rule collapsed under the weight of its own cruelty, the Riverlords collectively threw their support behind the new king, Jaehaerys I. Jaehaerys I Targaryen ruled peacefully for 55 years, and throughout this time, House Frey seems to have been going about business as usual. However, this story gets a bit more detailed as we arrive at the prelude to the Dance of the Dragons. House Frey resurfaces after this 55-year absence from the historical record during Princess Rhaenyra's bachelorette tour in the Riverlands during the year 122 AC. A younger son of the Lord of the Crossing named Forrest openly asked for her hand in marriage. A Targaryen marriage was way beyond the phrase pay grade, and he was rejected outright. 
After this incident, he was known far and wide as Fool Frey. We don't see this moment in House of the Dragon, but there is indeed a fray among Rhaenyra's suitors at Storm's End. We have no idea who he's supposed to be in the show canon, and he does seem a bit too old to be Forrest Frey himself. However, the presence of the Freys does do a good job of establishing their role in the future of this conflict. Forrest Frey grew up, inherited the lordship of the Crossing, and married one Lady Sabatha of House of Iprin, a fellow Riverland house. As Forrest came into power, conflict was brewing between the branches of House Targaryen. Good to note, this next section will contain spoilers for House of the Dragon. If you'd like to avoid spoilers, be sure to skip ahead to the late Targaryen era chapter that Fantasy Haven has so kindly marked out in the description for you. He's so great, and you should subscribe to him. So which side did Forrest Frey rally behind? The Greens or the Blacks? I'll reiterate what Quinn said. This chapter will contain minor spoilers for the future of Hot D. In the Stormlands, Lord Boris Baratheon declared for Aegon, and his vassals followed suit. Things were not so simple in the Riverlands, where the Muppet Tullys brooded. While the bedridden Lord Grover was green to his old bones, his grandson and heir Sir Elmo proved to be a proud black. Sir Elmo defied his father and kept the Tully banners at Riverrun, instead of marching against the Queen. Thus were the Riverlords divided between Aegon and Rhaenyra. The Brackens of Stonehenge and the Strongs of Harrenhal supported the former, while the Blackwoods of Raventree and the Malisters of Seaguard pledged fealty to the latter. Even different branches of the same house were split, such as the Green Vances of Atranta and the Black Vances of Wayfarer's Rest. Lord Forrest Frey was rejected by Rhaenyra all those years ago and mocked as a fool. However, unlike his descendant Walder, he's not a complete bitch, and he doesn't let this minor slight affect his political decision making. As such, House Frey threw their lot behind the Black Queen in 129 AC. Forrest added his troops to Daemon Targaryen's Riverland host and took part in the storming of Stonehenge, with houses Darry, Piper, and Root. Lord Humphrey Bracken was captured, and House Bracken turned their cloaks from green to black. In 130 AC, Forrest brought 200 knights and 600 infantrymen to join black forces at the God's Eye Lake to defend against the approaching Westman host of Lord Humphrey Lefford. The ensuing battle by the lakeshore was the bloodiest land battle of the dance. It became known as the Fish Feed, for many of the Westmen drowned in the God's Eye itself. Although the blacks claimed their bitter victory, Lord Forrest Frey was slain. He left behind a son and heir, and his widow Sabatha Frey continued to fight for Rhaenyra. Pretty much as soon as the Dance of the Dragon ends, our amount of information on the Freys decreases drastically for a little while. This is mostly because Fire and Blood ends soon after this conflict, so what information we do have is from the somewhat less detailed World Book. The Freys drop off the historical record for about 80 years, as we don't hear from them from the year 130 AC until the year 212 AC. However, once they do pop back up, they do so in a big way. During the reign of King Aerys I, Lord Frey attended a wedding tourney at the Castle of White Walls, intended to celebrate a marriage between his daughter and one Lord Ambrose Butterwell, which might well be the best name in the series in terms of house names. We the readers get to see this tournament through the eyes of Sir Duncan the Tall, and Dunk gets to meet Lord Frey's four-year-old son, the one and only Walder Frey. This is the same guy who ends up in the main series, and he seems just as awful as a child. Dunk notes that he's surprised that no one has pushed this four-year-old down a well as of yet. As we learn through Dunk's perspective, this entire tourney was a facade, designed to advance the claim of Daemon Blackfire II. The tournament was meant as an excuse for rebellious lords to gather together and scheme to crown a new king. The prize for winning this tourney is Lord Butterwell's prized dragon egg, which these lords hoped Daemon would hatch as a sign to legitimacy to his claim. Unfortunately for these rebel lords, their plan was quickly suppressed by Bloodraven, aka Brendan Rivers, aka Maynard Plum, aka the Three-Eyed Crow, aka Bittersteel's best pal. Bloodraven served as both Hand of the King and Master of Whispers during this era, and he ruled with an iron fist in the king's stead. Lord Frey was captured by Bloodraven, but was left let go soon after. This has led fans to speculate. Was Frey punished later, or did Frey betray his conspirators, allowing Bloodraven to uncover this plot? Some years later, that same punchable four-year-old became Lord of the Crossing. Walder Frey claims to have hosted three kings at his castle, which makes the exact timing of his rule a bit up in the air. It's unclear if he's referring to Robb Stark as one of these kings, so this statement could mean either he became Lord of the Crossing under Aerys II, with those three kings being Aerys, Robert, and Robb Stark, or it could mean that he became Lord under Jaehaerys II, and those three kings were Jaehaerys, Aerys, and Robert. Regardless of exactly when he ascended to his seat, Lord Walder Frey has been in power for a long time. During this era, he has been quite successful in arranging marriages for his children. He married his second son, Emmon, to Jenna Lannister, despite her ten-year-old brother Tywin speaking out loudly against the match. Unfortunately for Walder, he's never been able to secure a marriage alliance with the ruling family of the Riverlands, that being House Tully. 
Rebellion arrived at the Frey's doorstep in the year 282 AC. Lord Hustertully and most of the Riverlands rose up against the Mad King, aiding Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark in their revolution. Many battles took place in the Riverlands throughout this war, including the decisive Battle of the Triton. This was a massive clash of troops, however, Walter Frey's forces did not arrive until the battle was effectively over. The rebels didn't take kindly to this, and Hustertully gave the Lord of the Crossing a new nickname, the Late Walder Frey. Hoster also refused to attend Walder's wedding to his seventh wife. The Farings and Aarons refused marriage offers of and wards, respectively, as well. So he really did not do a good job of ingratiating himself to the rebels and the new families in power under this new Baratheon regime. At the start of the main series, the ancient Walder Frey has had nine wives, 22 trueborn sons, seven trueborn daughters, and a bunch of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. His vassals are House Charlton, House Aaronford, and House Hay. Hey, hi, hey, grrr. When Hostetully calls his banners in support of Rob Stark, Walder Frey delays his response. And when the Northmen need to cross the Green Fork to get to the besieged River Run, Catelyn is forced to negotiate. What a nice guy. The terms are as follows. Catelyn must take two Frey children to Winterfell to be raised as wards. Arya Stark must wed Walder's 22nd son, Elmar. And Rob Stark must take Walder's 18th son, Olivar, as a squire. Oh, and Rob has to marry a Frego or something, it's not a big deal. Pretty generous terms, actually. No way anyone could screw those up. The Freys finally march with King Rob, and Walder's firstborn son and heir, Sisteron, bravely commands his men during the Battle of the Whispering Wood. Although, Walder's second son, Emon Frey, and his children by Jenna Lannister, fight for King Joffrey. For obvious reasons. Frey forces take part in the Battle of Oxcross, in which Lord Tywin Lannister's cousin is slain. Sisteron receives a minor wound, but dies a few days later. Minor wounds in such times can certainly lead to danger, but there's definitely something suspicious about this death. The heirdom of the twins passes to his eldest son, Ryman, and Ryman's sons, Edwin and Blackwater, get one step closer to the lordship. After Rob Stark remembers he's a teenage boy and sleeps with Jane Westerling, he marries her to preserve her honour. House Frey is outraged and breaks from the young wolf's army. After Hostetully dies, Lord Walder sends his sons Lame Lothar and Walder Rivers to broker a marriage pact between the new Lord Edmure Tully and Rosalind Frey, his fifth daughter. What could go wrong? It's a trap! Welcome to the Red Wedding, directed by Walder Frey and Roose Bolton, written by Lothar Frey and produced by Lannister Studios, starring Edmure Tully with Rob Stark's body and Rob Stark's head. Special shout out to Bastard Walder for the stunt choreography and Merritt Frey for providing the drinks. Soundtrack produced by the band We Are Definitely Not Cell Swords in Disguise. Aren't they great, everybody? One dire wolf and several thousand Northmen were harmed in the making of this wedding. Many Northern Lords are killed or captured, and the drunken common soldiers are slaughtered in their tents by Frey, Bolton, and Karstark troops. The Frey casualties are minimal. Only four nobles die, and around 50 soldiers are killed in the camps. The King in the North is stabbed in the heart by Roose Bolton, and his mother Catelyn has her throat cut, although she was supposed to be taken hostage. I'll be delving deeper into the Red Wedding in a later video. The perpetrators are pardoned of treason and rewarded by the Lannisters. An unnamed Frey girl is betrothed to Sir Davin Lannister, an unnamed Frey bastard is betrothed to Tywin's baseball niece, Joy Hill, Amorai Frey is married to Lancel Lannister, creating the cadet branch, House Lannister of Darry, and Sir Emmon Frey is given the lands and incomes of the Tullys, forming the cadet branch, House Frey of Riverrun. Tywin has clearly been playing too much Crusader Kings. But these rewards may not have been worth the betrayal. Perhaps worse than the massacre itself is the breaking of the sacred custom of guest right, the ancient notion that if a guest eats and drinks beneath the host's roof, neither may harm the other. The phrase broke this on an enormous scale and became reviled throughout the Seven Kingdoms. Arriving at my favourite book in the series, A Feast for Crows, the phrase take on a fairly prominent role. Both Jamie and Brienne spend a sizable amount of time in the Riverlands, and Jamie interacts quite a bit with House Frey. They're effectively useless during the Siege of Riverrun, and Jamie is left to solve the situation pretty much on his own. The Freys are in a decent position following the War of the Five Kings, but their overall status hasn't really changed at all. They've been granted Riverrun, yes, but they're not the Lord's Paramount of the Trident. That title was granted to Lord Peter Baelish, who was given Harrenhal following the Battle of the Blackwater. This is a pretty large slight against House Frey, and it seems unclear as to whether or not they're going to hold a grudge for this in the long run. The Riverlands during feasts are quite a dangerous place. Thieves and outlaws roam the land, and Peter Pimple, Merritt, and Ryman Frey are all ambushed and hanged by the Brotherhood Without Banners, seemingly on the orders of their new mysterious leader. The rest of the Frey's plot so far takes place in the north, during a dance with dragons. A good deal of this story revolves around Wyman Manderley, Lord of White Harbor. Wyman lost family members at the Red Wedding, and his son Wyllis is still a captive at the Twins at the start of the book. 
Lord Manderley agrees to a number of terms in order to ensure his son's safe return. He swears fealty to the crown, opens White Harbor to trade, and marries two of his granddaughters to Freys in exchange for Willis's safe return. In order to secure this alliance, three Freys journey to White Harbor. We meet Rhaegar, Simon, and Jared Frey through Davis's perspective in Dance. While on the surface, Wyman seems friendly towards these guests, he expresses murderous intent to Davos. These Freys broke guest right at the Twins, and he intends to do the same. The three Freys vanish from White Harbor, and Wyman soon arrives at Winterfell in order to show his support for the Boltons. In what is undoubtedly a huge coincidence, Wyman also arrives with three massive pork pies, which are presented to the Freys in Winterfell during a wedding feast. This, combined with the story of the rat cook being told in close proximity to these events, has led the people to believe that Freys were baked into these pies. Something similar happened at the end of the Game of Thrones Season 6, but with Arya instead of Wyman Manderley. At the end of A Dance with Dragons, all of the Freys in the North are in quite a difficult spot. One of the Freys in Winterfell, Little Walder, was already mysteriously murdered, and this created a massive increase in tension, which resulted in both the Manderleys and the Freys being expelled from Winterfell to deal with Stannis Baratheon in the field, in what the fans are calling the Battle of Ice. So what is to come for the Freys? The lords and the small folk of the Riverlands and the North despise them. Tensions are boiling in Winterfell and a big battle against Stannis is about to go down. Down south, Lady Stoneheart and the Brotherhood are hanging traitors all over the place. And an upcoming Lannister Frey wedding hasn't really been timed well. What is the ultimate fate of the Freys? Well, Quinn and I have already made that video on his channel. Hey, just wanted to pop in again before the end. Thank you very much for having me. It's been very fun talking about the phrase. I look forward to talking about them more, hopefully in a live stream in the future. But for those of you who might be interested, we did another video over on my channel theorizing about the phrase role in the winds of winter in a potential Red Wedding 2.0 that is coming up. So yeah, be sure to like this video, subscribe to Fantasy Haven, all that. And then be sure to come over to my channel, check that out as well. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Fantasy, for having me. Wait, he's got more subs than me? Alexa? Play range of Castam. If you enjoyed this video, hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell. What do you think awaits House Frey in the winds of winter? And what should my next video be about? Let me know in the comments below.